Today's guest is Amira Hall. Amira is an internationally renowned clairvoyant energy healer, speaker, and teacher. Amira is a matrix energetic practitioner, a Reiki master, and an ordained minister. She has a BA in business and an MS in metaphysics. Amira has studied with top intuitive energy training schools and teachers in the United States. She is the author of Love Up Your Life and is the executive producer and host of Lessons from the Light Radio. Welcome to the show, Amira. Thank you, Maverick. It's really exciting to be here with you. Thank you for hosting me. My pleasure. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, a little bit. There's It goes a long way. <laughs> um, you know, I've always been somebody that's been hypersensitive, and I, I never saw that e- even as a superpower. But I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize that all my sensitivities and um, awarenesses that most people didn't have a sense of is actually a gift. Um, but really didn't really hit home until I had a near-death experience. It was literally like I was stopped in my tracks on my career path. Um, I often say to it, others that, you know, it was as if my clock stopped and started again on a whole new track. And so, although I've been sensitive most of my life and had paranormal experiences of grandfathers appearing and aunts and uncles appearing um, and many, many un um Well, we didn't talk about these subjects, let's just say, but they were mysterious. They were, ooh, spooky, spooky subjects, the matters that didn't go far in our family. So I didn't have the validation that these things were real. And my mother always said I had a great imagination, Um, but that's where it went. And so life changed after my near-death experience, and that was over 24 years ago now. And that's when my abilities to see the invisible or the unseen or in the in the non-physical realms began to be triggered and um you know I, I, I yeah it was almost as if i was seeing through dimensions and everything became hyper alert so wow so initially just kind of sensitive kind of that intuitive uh, almost hairs on the back of your neck type awareness and then after your near death experience it was like a reset and then you could actually see into this other dimension more thoroughly. Yeah, I think, you know, I was raised Catholic in a really conservative home in Canada. And growing up, you know, there were no discussions around metaphysical or, you know, it was before its time. So let's, let's say that. I mean, I always had a fascination with the occult. I always had a fascination of having psychic powers, but I didn't feel that I had it. Now, on the flip side of that, I was always called the family, pardon me, but the shit disturber, because <laughs> I was calling people on their lies. I would see the truth that other people couldn't see, or somehow their perception was distorting. And I had an uncanny ability to sort of read between the lines of things. And so I think that propelled me into the interests of the occult. Not to mention, you know, probably uh, past life experience, etc. that was, you know, carrying over. And it wasn't, like I said, until the near-death experience, I was literally forced to stop what I was doing. I was in sales and marketing, very successful. And my whole life was literally redirected. And at the, after my, when I came back to the States and because my near death experience happened while I was traveling in Egypt, I had a, a, a two week spiritual pilgrimage while I was traveling there. And so, you know, having an experience of meditating with our group in the Great Pyramid, having an initiatory experience in the, you know, the King's Chamber and, and, and make high level prayers, connections with the unseen worlds and let's say the um, mystery schools, walking the path of the mystery school prophets and teachers, it was pretty extrasensory stimulating, let's just say. And then when the near death occurred and then coming back to the U S I was like so wide open, I couldn't function. And so I soon lost my job. And 
every time I would get interviewed, I wouldn't get the job. I mean, I would go for three interviews, high level positions with the same company and it happened three times over. They, you know, I wasn't picked and I thought, okay, the spirit's trying to tell me something. I'm not supposed to walk that path anymore. And so that's where everything literally got redirected and I couldn't function in it in the real, what we call the real world. <laughs> um, you know, the, the 3d world, even going to the supermarket or the grocery store, doing any mundane activities was just overload for me. And I literally had to learn how to manage my new psychic abilities, my abilities to communicate with the unseen world, the dead that aren't dead. But I started to realize, okay, you know, the, the deceased individuals are living. They are alive. And um, that then, you know, there weren't schools or ways to explore this. And I went to probably, oh, probably half a dozen, maybe, no, maybe closer to a dozen psychics and healers trying to find out what happened to me. Because I was the same, but I was way different. So if all my abilities were cranked up on super high, then I needed to either learn how to balance them and turn them down a little bit so I could still function in the human form. So it was really learning that dance and learning how to calibrate my skills, my tools, my vibration. And then that's what launched me on the path of teaching others how to manage their energy to manifest what they want to experience or their heart's desires here in the 3D life. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. As members of the first responder and military communities, we need to be planning today for our transition from these careers. Because unfortunately, as many have experienced, these careers can tell us the ride is over before we're ready for it to be done. My name is Paul Pantani and I've spent the past 30 years in law enforcement, working in various assignments and promoting through the ranks of leadership. With the help of my guests, who like you are either former or current military members or first responders, the goal of this podcast is to provide you with information to help you in your planning. But just as important, we can't forget to take care of ourselves today. So I'm also going to have guests who are going to talk about how to be more physically and mentally fit. Wow. So can we go backwards a little bit and kind of discuss being inside of the Great Pyramid and, and what that was like and, and kind of what you were learning and studying at that point before the NDE? That sounds amazing. Yeah, it really was. And, you know, I'm trying to reflect. I've been back to Egypt now 12 times. And so each experience is unique in their own way. So they kind of blur together. So excuse me. But um, some of the some of the highlights were what would we would do is, first of all, the king's chamber is constructed in a way that, you know, sound experts and technicians and engineers have tested the sound and the quality of the, of the great pyramid with the granite and the the stru the actual structure of it has the highest most clear high vibratory resonance of any place on the planet and so they have not been able to reproduce that effect anywhere so when we're there our group, we would circle around. There's an empty granite sarcophagus. Now, there's the modern Egyptologists talk about this being a burial chamber of the king or the pharaoh, but in fact, it was not. It was an initiatory chamber, it was a passage of rites, so to speak. You lay in the great sarcophagus that there was no lid, okay? So each one of us would take turns laying in it. And the group would circle, encircle the, the, the sarcophagus and chant Om. So there's this high resonance of Om's Om, 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 everybody at a different tone and a different space of Om. And so that would just literally transcend you into an altered space or state. So mm. this is not an, a drug induced experience at all. But it truly was an out-of-body experience for me many, many, many times. One of the first times I had, now, um, yeah, I'm sorry, the stories are starting to bleed together. <laughs> I okay. wanted to tell you another one, but I'll finish with this. 
So I was in the, in the sarcophagus and I started having this vision of these masters descending from a golden staircase. And these masters were dressed in, they looked like costumes, okay? They looked from like clothing from different eras and different cultures and different times and different places. So it was a real random mix of kings and queens and God knows warriors. And they all came down to see me and it was really overwhelming. I was like, if, if imagine if it's your birthday and you're just so excited because there's a surprise party for you and all of these people show up that you haven't seen in, let's say, thousands of years. That was what it was like. And so there they were and they were all just shining bright standing in front of me. They, after they descended the staircase, they just lined up in front in single file. So the line really went off into infinity. I couldn't see the end of the line. Then all of a sudden, without words or any sound, the line split. So there were two lines. And one said to me, we are the masters of the light. And the other said, we're masters of the dark. Who do you follow? And I, you know, I never hesitated. I follow the masters of the light. But that moment and that experience lives with me today over 24 years because dealing with the unseen world, they looked identical. These were masters. They could make themselves appear and look and present anything that they wanted. And so we in 3D, the challenge becomes how do we discern? We might think we're working with, you know, let's say Angel Raphael, when it might not be. And I mean, that really kind of twisted my brain a little bit. And I don't know that I have an answer, but it's always in the back of my mind. Who am I working with? Who am I channeling? You know, I've got over the years in doing this work, you know, I've met many, many, many channelers and a lot of trance channels and a lot of conscious channels. But you know, they say they channel somebody, but how do you know? How do you know for sure? Right. How does it resonate? And is the information accurate? Is it the same? Is it consistent? All of those things would constantly plague my, you know, my mind. Uh, so that's one profound experience. And then, so as I mentioned, it was an initiatory chamber where um, initiates would take their final step of initiation at various levels of mastery. So that all sort of fits together. Another experience was where we were just sitting around, we could pick a spot and just sit and meditate, go within. And I remember like, well, what is this great pyramid? And I, I wasn't one of those persons that was fascinated. Yes, the architecture is incredible in Egypt. You know, just being in the presence of these immense temples is just overwhelming to our senses. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the age of it and the exquisite engineering, you know, the expertise and the, the um, mastery. You know, it's beyond us, isn't it? We haven't even been able to replicate mm -hmm. the yeah. building of the pyramid. So I kept asking, you know, I didn't want the books or encyclopedias or, you know, now I'm dating myself, aren't I? I didn't <laughs> want any reference books to be, to jade the information that I was getting on this. And the information I got was, this is a transformer. And it's a generator at the same time. And then what I saw was beings coming and going through like a portal through the Great Pyramid. So I could see and understand from my own experiences over the years is that it not only raises your vibration and helps to facilitate you traveling or, or extending through different portals, but coming and going. So mm. it's not necessarily just to leave, like let's say a Stargate, it could be that, but it's also to bring people back. So it's like a beam me up, Scotty kind of, <laughs> you know, place of just leaving the body. That's something I've, I've wondered about. And, you know, depending on who you talk to or, or what the source is, there's so many theories on the function of the pyramids, but that is one of them that I've heard that it was for initiating some type of out of body experience. And I remember um, seeing those very narrow channels that 
that go from the chambers out to the, the exterior. And it's too small for anybody to have built or travel through. And one of the theories is that it's like a, a, a space for the, the person out of body to follow or something like that. Yeah, it makes sense. But but from my own personal experience, I don't think as a master, we need those little doorways or portals, right? We we just, we leave this 3D and there is no need for a physical, that's what I mean is a physical portal. Right. And I also wonder, um, you mentioning laying in the sarcophagus and kind of being surrounded by the chanting. I wonder if that, that has kind of been degraded over the years with the different mystery traditions or or cults where they're like laying in coffins and you know doing who knows what if that's kind of like a distortion and degradation of what the original secret mysteries were in Egypt that were referenced in ancient texts and and so forth well and i also i agree but i also think that it's sort of an a part of the journey of letting go of your old self or a, an aspect to yourself dying away as you right you know, like stepping into a new version of yourself and a new ascended vibratory level. And definitely the sound is, you know, a high, high component in that. And uh, we, we know that sound is healing. You know, we're starting that to catch sense. up that, to the ancient probably... technologies, aren't we? <laughs> If you have been struggling to change your drinking habits, I know how frustrating it can be, especially when your best attempts have you thinking about alcohol even more. That's because counting days and avoiding alcohol actually makes it harder. My name is Mary Wagstaff, and I am here to help you make lasting change this year. As an expert certified holistic alcohol coach and host of the podcast, Stop Drinking and Start Living, I offer an evolutionary proven process to help you get alcohol out of your way and keep it there that fits seamlessly into your lifestyle. If you're ready for a new perspective on an old habit, subscribe to Stop Drinking and Start Living on your favorite podcast platform. That sounds very consistent with like what what Jesus was probably trying to teach when he went to Egypt and then came back and was trying to teach rebirth and being like a new creation and kind of like a higher level being, you know, something along the lines of what what was going on there in the pyramids. Yeah. And and then you will do what I do and much more as a healer, as a Mm -hmm. visionary, as a, you know, mystic knowing knowing the future, knowing what to do and trusting and aligning with the divine, the father. Right. Yeah. I, I like looking for those kind of consistencies or like the, the links in the chain, the puzzle pieces that kind of connect the different traditions and stories. And it, it kind of seems like a common thread there. So after you had these pyramid experiences, then you had a near death experience. Do you, do you want to elaborate on, on what happened and then, and what you recall from that experience? So, you know, (laughs) yeah, it's a little bit of a story. So there were were kind of two parts to it. At the time, I did not know it was a near-death experience. In fact, I spent a long time trying to figure out what happened to me. This was in 1998, and that was before the internet. So there I was. I had extended my stay after our spiritual trip finished, and I went back to Luxor, and I was buying some beads. I was designing jewelry at the time semi-precious jewelry. And these homes were built right on the backside of the Valley of the Kings on the mountain. And so these villagers would dig from the back wall of their house into the mountain at night because they're looking for treasures and tombs. And so in the daytime, they would, oh, maybe they were digging in the day, but they would camouflage the back hole of their of their house with a great big Persian carpet or an Egyptian woven carpet, right? So you didn't know there was a hole there and they were digging. So I figured these people got to know, they got to have some antiquities. They got to have some little treasures, some beads that I could take back and incorporate into my jewelry. So I did find somebody because I was there with a friend and he knew everybody in the village. He was from the village, found somebody and I got my beads and then I had to go back the day I was traveling back to the U.S., I went to pay them uh, the money that I was outstanding. And after I went to the ATM, got the money, and 
I went back. Well, when you pay for something in the Middle East, it's not just here's your money and you run, right? It's a visit. It's a ritual. You have coffee or tea. You sit and visit. It's the polite thing to do. So because I was a friend of uh, Hajjaj, they brought out a joint. And um, they thought they was, at the time, you know, this is the best, the very best. And they were screaming at me <laughs> and I, cause I was politely declining. I say, no, thank you. It's not, you know, I don't smoke. And I'm, you know, I've smoked pot a few times. It didn't do anything for me. It, it wasn't something that grabbed me. Okay. So I'm like, no, you know, I just don't want to. Plus I was traveling that day. Right. So, um, well, I thought, <laughs> There is, what, what are you laughing at? It's it's that uh that conflict of you know what you do and what you don't do, and then not wanting to be rude and being in that awkward situation. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I'm the only female there. I'm the only American there, and so with an uh, you know Arab Egyptian screaming at the top of his voice saying you know it's the best. I was really intimidated and a little bit frightened, but. At the same time, knowing I was going to be okay, um, you know, okay, I'll just go along with the with the plan here, keep the peace, and do, you know, I'll, I'll be on my way. No big deal, right? Uh -huh. But it didn't go like that. And so there was like 10 guys that instantly showed up in the room, and they passed this joint around twice, okay? And everybody, I was sitting on the only plastic, it was like a plastic lawn chair, you know, only chair in the room. And I mean, we're talking primitive, okay, Maverick. And everything was very primitive, and and everybody jumps up and ready to go, and I can't get out of the chair, and I'm pinned to the chair, and I find myself standing behind myself. Oh, wow. I see myself sitting in the chair, and I see everybody's life like it was like um, ten different television sets all playing a different movie. And it was everybody in the room's movie. And of course, they're all playing wow. at the same time. There wasn't any information I could discern, right? But it was pretty creepy. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm leaving my body. I have to stay in my body. So I, it was like me talking to myself, stay in your body, stay in your body. And then I, I don't remember saying the words. I don't know how they heard me, but I had my hands out in front and I watched my friend slow motion, go to the cooler, get me a bottle of water and bring it back towards me. And they're all laughing hysterically. And for me, it's kind of a blur, like I'm in a dream or slow motion. Hmm. And I remember him pouring water into my hands. And as it was getting closer to my face, I, the last thought I had was, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> so it was like, oh my God, what a, <laughs> what a crazy last thought. <laughs> so I was gone and they told me that my body stiffened. I fell out of the chair and I, they were pounding my chest with all their might, like bam, 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 you know, and my breathing stopped. They grabbed me under the arms, dragged me out, hailed down a tax taxi, which is a pickup trick truck. And those, their taxis have benches on either side of the cab. And then, of course, there's a driver. My friend got in the middle of the cab and they plunked me on the passenger side outside the window. So they're barreling down the road. My head's out the window. They're hoping I'm going to get some oxygen see, to bring back Jeez. my breathing. That's and crazy. they were headed to a hospital. Well, the next part I remember was I was shooting through the sky and it was like a night sky. I could see stars all around me. And there was the earth way off in the distance, a small little ball. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger. And I knew I was headed to that blue ball. The, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, such a big place. How am I going to find myself? And then I heard an, a language I don't remember. And that language, then it went, where am I? Where am I? I don't know that language. Then went, oh, Arabic. Oh, Egypt. And then I, I, it was like a GPS going do, 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 pinning into where my body was. Hmm. And when I located my body, then I couldn't get in the body. It was, it was thick and, and gooey. And it's like putting on a wet, wetsuit. 
Hmm, and you okay. know, you struggle with it. It's yep. uncomfortable. It's, you know, it's not fun. Right. Right. Yep. And I couldn't open my eyes. The light was intense outside. It felt like somebody, when your eyes, when you're looking at the sun with no sunglasses on and your eyes are super wide, it felt like that with my eyes closed. Wow. And I, I, I struggled to open my eyes. So I just reached out. I could hear the voices and I touched my friend's arm. And then all of a sudden they started shouting. They're freaked out. Like, oh my God, she's coming back to you know life. I don't know for sure they said that, but they were speaking in Arabic. I really freaked them out. Hmm. So I said, where are you taking me? And they said, shouted in Arabic. I didn't know what that was, but then they realized, oh my God, she doesn't speak Arabic. We got to speak English. You know, they forgot themselves in the stress of the moment. And they said, well, to the hospital, to the hospital. And I'm like, what? A hospital? Man, that." that's going to kill me in the village here. You know, a place like that's got to be uber pr primitive. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, man, I just need a bathroom. My gut was just ready to explode. And I just needed a bathroom now. Well, that presented another problem because in the village, there were no Western bathrooms. And when I say that, I mean, bathrooms there are like holes in the wall, uh, floor. And there's two little foot markers for your feet. That's it. <laughs> so, you know, here I am a Western lady and I can't even stand up. So it's a problem in their culture for a man to be with a woman when she does her thing. <laughs> so it's like one problem after the other, you know, and, and all of these overlaps of psychological, you know, why they made certain decisions. Jeez. <laughs> The Egyptian version of the hangover movie. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. It was cuckoo crazy. And and then um, I guess the funny thing about this whole taxi ride was over the years when I would go back, every time people would see my friend, they would shout, Amira. Apparently when it was, everything was happening, <laughs> he was shouting at the top of his lungs, my name. So it became like a town <laughs> echo. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I became a real um, fixture in the village. So <laughs> they finally, when I finally convinced them I need a bathroom, then they're like reconfiguring their plan. And they brought me to his brother's place and three floors up. Now they had to carry me up three floors. And uh, it got me into the bathroom and I wouldn't let my friend leave. There was enough of a sense within me, like not fear, but I didn't want to be alone. Okay. Right. If that makes any sense. Now, yeah. another scandal was erupting on the other side of the bathroom door because it's a scandal for the man to be with a girl. And the sister-in-law thought we were in the bathroom having sex. And mm. so it became like an Egyptian soap opera. <laughs> and tears are streaming down my friend's face. And he says, Amira, you don't understand. You don't understand. He goes, you died. You died. Your heart stopped. Your breathing stopped. And I'm like, I'm fine. I just felt bliss. I felt such bliss. And, you know, at this point, people could say, whoa, that was some good stuff. All right. You know, you got really stoned. But I don't, I don't subscribe to that. And it never felt like that to me. Um, they immediately started with hydrating me and with juices and yogurt and water. And that's actually a real common cause of death is dehydration. So there may have been some of that. And prior to my trip to Egypt, I had been on a month long detox. And so I was super clean. And having been on that spiritual you know, retreat for two weeks. It's just like everything was amplified. You know, it was a perfect mm -hmm. moment for an out of body near death. You know, I'm out of here. So yeah, it sounds like you're already primed for something like that. Right, right. Everything. It was a perfect storm, so to speak. Yeah. Or a perfect, you know, getaway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getaway. I like that. And so all of that, it took me hours to be able to walk again. 
And I didn't feel stoned. Like I've been high before, not high from like, just even from a good, you know, buzz from a, some wine or anything like that. It didn't feel like that. And then what happened was immediately I started seeing the goddess Sekhmet. And the goddess Sekhmet was a lion faced goddess with a female body. Mm. I didn't remember because it was my first trip to Egypt, all the deities and all the gods that they talked about didn't really resonate with me. I mean, they're great stories and they're fascinating and all that, but they didn't speak to me yet. And I, there was a small window to my right and there was this, you know, sheer drapery that was blowing from the wind that was coming in the breeze. And I kept looking outside because there was the green Valley, the Nile Valley, all the crops, the farmer's crops. And I kept looking out that that's real. And then when I'd look at the armoire, as I saw Sekhmet's figure, that's not real. I can't look there. I have to keep looking outside. So I kept struggling in a 3D experience of seeing 3D and then not seeing 3D, if that makes any sense. So was that like when that other dimension began to open up for you? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, that was the moment. And I didn't really get to, like when I got to the airport later that day, so later that day, the same day, I had to fly from Luxor to Cairo. And then I was having the international flight from Cairo to New York. And in the line at the airport, I ran into the tour guides that were guiding us, of which one of them I'm taking another group back with me um, in October. So Mary was there and I said, well, who's the goddess? Who's this lion face, you know, female body? And she goes, oh, that's Sekhmet. She's known as the healer of healers. She's known as the patron saint to all the doctors in ancient times. Oh, wow. Yeah. So well, how, that, how appropriate. Yeah. Well, I'm like, uh, okay, what does this mean? Again, it was too early for me to comprehend the vastness of this. And to this day, she comes to me all the time. Yeah. Jeez, what and a it, crazy experience. And it just keeps going. I mean, it just didn't stop there. It was like I was living... a a, a near death that wasn't just seeing. So for, for quite honestly, where things really got weird was when I got to New York, I got off the jetway. I slept almost the whole way from Cairo to New York, which was, I think about a nine hour flight. Mm. We're talking 12 hours, at least 12 to 15 hours from my, ex more than that from the experience to New York. So if that was some good pot, I'm sure the, the effects would be over by now, right? Yeah. Well, they said it was the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So <laughs> you got to believe everything an Egyptian says too. <laughs> um, so get to New York and everybody coming off the jetway looks like a black and white paper doll. Hmm. Walking paper dolls. And they're flat. They're two-dimensional. And I, all I can feel was grief and anger and hatred. And I'm like, oh, shit, I don't want to be here. This is nasty. This is so awful. This is horrible. And I kept staring at my book, and ultimately it was upside down. I could not read, but I just had to look at something that felt real to me. And so this continued until I got off the plane in San Diego. When, the, when I hit that moist air... At the San Diego airport, everything sh switched. It's like it switched off. Now, I don't know if that was because I arrived in my home area that felt familiar and I was somehow safe or something. I don't know. But the anger, the fear, and the grief, and the depression continued for months. And I couldn't get out of it. And I was miserable. I lost my job. Um, then I, that was when I couldn't get hired to save my soul. And I went to a lot of different psychics, a lot of different healers, trying to find out what happened. And that pissed me off even more because they all told me something different. And I'm like, well, you guys are real good. Yeah, you know, I don't trust you anymore because, you know, why is everybody telling me something different? I would think that there would be a common thread. Right. There was no common thread. One thing, one reader, card reader, I went to, a friend took me to Mexico, to Tijuana. And this card reader, she was doing Spanish, and my friend was translating for me. And she goes, uh, telling her in Spanish, I didn't understand everything she said, but she said, El Mor, El Morte, 
And I knew that from French, I'd morir, which she like died. Time. And it was saying like, in the past, she died. The cards were in the past saying that I died. And then I went, okay, that's great. Now, now I know I'm not crazy. I, I mean, something like that happened. That's, and this, this was before there was a lot of books on near death experiences or, or the internet. Right. So I had no references. Yeah. So I was struggling, struggling for a very long time to validate what happened to me was real. And then my supersonic psych psychic abilities and healing abilities had really turned on. I didn't know how to manage it. And so I started taking some uh, classes to heal me. And as I started to understand, you know, how to read the energy, how to turn down the energy, uh, uh, turn down my chakras so they weren't blasted wide open. And then I could just like reading a book, you can't digest the whole book. You have to start and read, you know, paragraph by paragraph, you know, eventually you can speed read if you have some training, but there's a process, right? So that you can understand what you're reading or the, the message behind it. So it's like that with our psychic abilities. And so I learned, uh, mostly I had to learn how to protect my own energy because unbeknownst to me, my entire life, I was an empath supersonic sensitive, right? So nobody's taught us how to manage our energy. And that's what we are. We are energetic beings. Yeah, I was just thinking it's it's amazing because we all have the potential to turn that stuff on and, and amplify that, but not everyone does. And, uh, you know, people that go through an NDE or are intently focused on developing those abilities, like that's when it starts to work. Well, and I believe we're all pre-wired pre with those abilities. That's part of our nature, right. our natural spiritual ability. But we turn them down. In fact, most kids are talking to the, our dead loved ones, you know, up until they're four or five, six years old. And that's literally shut off by the big people in our world. Oh, no, there's nobody else here. You know, some parents I've seen lately, you know, where they encourage their kids to talk about it, where they can actually remember past lives even. Right? Yeah, I've, I've read some some great books on that and right. always kept an ear out for my own kids if in case they said anything that would kind of fit the mold for that. Um, and they, they have said some interesting things, but nothing that we could really develop or, you know, call evidence or proof. But just well, random... maybe, maybe it's one of those things just like we learn to do our ABCs and one, two, three, we learn those systems. Yeah. So, it's, it's like we, we are pre-wired to be able to do that. But as we, as children grow and integrate into the, the world that we live in and the expectations, it's almost like those traits are almost not encouraged or supported or needed. So they kind of fall dormant as we adapt into what we call regular life. That's a great way of saying it. Yeah, we're conditioned out of them. Right. Yeah, I I, I think that that is true. I, I believe that and, and the stuff that's out there supports that. So I really struggled for about a year. I was starting to write a book. I went to the Book Expo of America. That I, 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 My idea was I've got to write about this. And everybody I met there completely dismissed it. And I, I think, and even Louise Hayes and was at that conference. There was other people I ran into, Carolyn Meese, didn't exchange with her. Um, but there were people and publishers, I couldn't get anybody's interest. Mm. And I was really disappointed and frustrated. And um, I was lugging around all these books massive books there. Everybody's giving away free books at those things. Right. So I felt like a pack mule, you know, and I was just lugging around. I was, my back was killing me. So I needed a massage and I found this Chinese place to this day. I can't find them. It, it, that to me was a, like, did that really happen? So I go to this massage, there's this tiny little Asian man and he starts walking on my back. And something clicked in that moment I, I, because over the year and all the grief and the pain and the struggle that I was trying to 
remember, where did I go? It was always in the back of my mind. What happened? Where did I go? How come I didn't get to see Jesus and the frickin' tunnel of light, right? <laughs> yeah, that everybody talked about, right? It was becoming more and more of a conversation back then. I was mad that I, I got ripped off, you know? So everything started coming in. And literally, it's like, instead of the masters coming down the staircase, like they did in the Great Pyramid, I went up a great staircase. And when I got to the top of the staircase, my body completely melted and it changed into like a ball of light. And now, then is, it this, like, is this you experiencing this during the massage? Yeah, it literally, it was, it was like an instant download of where I went and what it okay, was. Okay. Okay. Like a memory. Right. So this is, well, yeah, it's a memory, but perhaps it was even a continuation. Okay. Because it's almost like there was energetic blocks, but I was so desperate to find out that answer. What was it? What was the whole purpose of the damn thing? You know? Mm -hmm. So literally it was almost like, uh, yeah, a download and everything erupted. And, and it was like a whole vision of where I evaporated, became this ball of light. And my guide said to me, I'm going to give you a tour of the all and you can't stay. You were just going to visit. And, and it was almost like I was riding on the wings of an eagle, like about a ball of light that carried me. And then I, I, I was transported into this immaculate, perfect building, a structure. And it was glistening. It was shimmering. It was, it was incredible. And there were, I was in a boardroom. There were like 12 part persons. They, weren't, they were androgynous and they had glowing heads. And it was as if the lid of their head opened up and this ball of light from the center of their head streamed right into my third eye, into my pineal gland. And the message I got was like, there were all these quantum streams of information. It was just, you know, code, I guess. But they told me the message was, you can access any information at any time that you want. It's all here for you. Wow. And I was plugged into all of them. And then immediately I was teleported out into this, in the front of this uh, hallway. And it was infinite hallway with doors on either side. And to this day, well, it wasn't, it was just recently that I finally got it after 24 years. This was the Hall of Records. Stress and trauma happen inside of our bodies. So we can't just heal them through talking. We must also heal them through feeling. My name is Luis Mojica. I'm a somatic educator and nutritionist, and I'm also the host of the Holistic Life Navigation podcast, where every week I teach you how to release stress and trauma and find a safety inside of yourself through nutrition, self-inquiry, and somatic experiencing. Join me over at the Holistic Life Navigation podcast or visit me at holisticlifenavigation.com. Wow. I was thinking s there's so many uh, similarities between what you experienced and what other people have reported, like being a point of energy or a ball of light and then um, going to something like a, like a board of authorities or, or figures that are, are there to kind of debrief you and then like the Akashic records, being able to access all the information, like all these things that, that you experienced before it was more widely known through the internet. Right. And, and I was dismissed, keep in mind, you know, so it's, it's almost like a humiliation. You know, I kept a lot of this to myself because I had nowhere to go with it. I didn't yeah. know what to do with it. Yeah. That's unfortunate. People weren't, people weren't ready for it. For, they, they just thought I was a freak. A lot of ND, ND ears experience that. They, their stories are not accepted or rejected or they feel ridiculed or, you know, like, wow, the more I say, they're just going to think I'm crazy, so I'm not going to say anything. 
or what a bender you went on, Amira, because that was some good stuff, as they said, you know. But that's the thing. And I think I felt embarrassed because it's not even part of my behavior to, to do drugs, especially in a foreign country. And, you know, what a dumbass I was, right, in a way, um, risking that thing, something like that. And then the other thing is most near deaths are validated by doctors or medical records or... Right. You know, all of that makes it legit. So mine wasn't legit. Yeah, well, it's hard. And, you know, p skeptics will be skeptics, even if you are on the operating table and you're, you flatline and all those things. So um, your truth is your experience. And it sounds like you, you did have an NDE. Well, and then, you know, what happened was I cooked, my guy told me I could enter any room, any door. So I walked through the first door on my right, which was a gold door, and I immersed into it. And it was like, it was incredible light and colors that I've never seen on earth. And it was like a moving kaleidoscope of patterns and colors. That's the best way I can describe it. Hmm. It was possibly intricate. And it was my guide or God, the voice was so comforting. And I asked, where am I? And the voice said to me, this is the all. This is the fabric of all creation. This is love. And it felt like I was in my mother's womb, where when I first incarnated and came into a form of feeling safe, that's the only thing I can relate to possibly what it might feel like safety and security and, you know, everything's perfect, right? You have no yeah. awareness of anything not being perfect. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And then I was told, well, you can't stay. And then it was bloop. I was out of that experience. It's kind of like now I'm just getting a flash. It's like an Alice in Wonderland moment, but it wasn't the effect of the drug. I know that for sure. And I think for me, that that's the validation perhaps I needed, right? That this right. was a continuation, it wasn't a factor of some pot, Egyptian pot, the best, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so... Um, then I, I'm in the corridor and I really had the thought in that moment, well, that was rude. I was enjoying that kind of, it was like, and then I was, went across the hall into this pink door and emerged into that experience. And it was a solid, o opaque, but yet translucent, like an emerald. Like I stepped into an emerald that was still, it was strong. And it was incredibly, well, healing. And immediately I saw a timeline of my life and I saw all the points of where I had difficulties, physical difficulties, health, and all my problems were related to my emotions. Hmm. And that was stuck energy on my timeline. And that what I needed to do was go back and heal or release the places where emotions were stuck in my experiences to heal my life and to move forward. That makes sense because, um, I mean, I've heard many times how stress can literally kill you or pain or emotional suffering can literally kill you. Like when you hear about people that have been married forever and, and one of them dies and then the other one is just so incredibly depressed and heartbroken that, that they die too. Or, you know, people that are just so completely under intense stress, they can start having problems with their organs or with their, you know, the, all the things that have to happen in the body, things can start breaking down. So that, I mean, that makes complete sense. Well, it's absolutely true. In fact, Dr. Bruce Lipton talks about it in the biology of belief in his book, you know, and there's science are, is proving that our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions can literally change our DNA. Hmm. Yeah, they're proving that now. And, you know, I was having a conversation with a lady last night and, you know, she's, she was diagnosed with uh, fibromyalgia. Now, back in 1991, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. The doctors told me death or wheelchair. Well, this lady I was talking to was in that exact place practically. And I told her this, you've got, you're holding, you've got inflammation. There's no question your body's responding, but it's because of trauma. And she goes, you're absolutely right. 
And she didn't go in to elaborate, but she says, I'm in therapy for trauma. So it's those emotional experiences that we'd like to bury and move on from that have been stored someplace. If it's not at the physical level, before the physical level, on the emotional level, and more than that, in the subconscious level of God knows where they're hidden, right? Right. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And so that's where I began my journey. And that's where I work with all my clients is digging out the stuff that's long forgotten. It's like that 90% of the iceberg below the water, right. that's where our answers lie. And that's within our, our subconscious. And it could even be past life carried over, or even you're processing or healing, let's say experiences our, your parents had, that you're unconsciously absorb that frequency as a result of just being in the womb, you absorb mm. your mom's energy. Right. Like that sensing of energy where you can enter a room and tell that like an argument happened there or something terrible happened, even though you weren't there for it, you can still absorb and, and be aware of that. So when I started to comprehend this and start putting the dots together, after that experience, my psychic abilities were off the charts. And I couldn't explain, like I started reading Coffee Grounds. That was the first thing I started doing in San Diego. And people would say, how did you just see all that in that muddy cup? So, so, <laughs> so I've heard of that all. before. I've heard yeah. of that before, but how, how does that work? I know absolutely nothing about that. Well, all I did was I'd made a mixture of, you know, thick coffee grounds and I'd pour them in a little cup, a little uh, um porcelain cup and then the person would hold the cup for a minute so in the middle east they'll have their they'll drink the coffee and then what's left is what you know so their vibration is going over the cup you've heard of tea leaf reading haven't you yes i've heard of that but the the coffee grounds interest me because i make espresso coffee every morning so okay. I, i'm around lots of coffee grounds i might have right. to start well, so it, it's it's you don't want it too thick it's got to be a thin enough residue right so it'll you swirl it around in your little in the bottom of your cup and you just look at the patterns so i just started seeing literally i was reading the person's energy field so a bit of a trick or sleight of hand i guess you could say or misinterpretation i'm reading their frequency and i didn't know what i was doing i was just using that as sort of my tool to open the door into their space. Like, like people use tarot cards or, you mm -hmm. know, uh, crystal balls or even water. So yeah, that was my introduction. And that's where people kept saying, well, how are you doing this? I'd like to learn. So that's when I started teaching psychic development. And when I say psychic development, it's, it's really at the beginning of healing ourself and healing the energies so that our natural abilities can open up. And your your abilities, Maverick, will be different than mine. But I can teach everybody how to you open their third eye and utilize their third eye at a higher level. That's so, cool. So yeah, so let's talk about what you do now uh, as far as your work of teaching people and and the mediumship. What what is that like? And what are some of the outstanding experiences that you'd like to share on the show? Well, let's see, they're all, <laughs> there's just so many. Um, I had one client that I was working with in Dubai. I was living there for five years and um, he came to me. He had tried, <clears throat> as he said, in his words, many branded um, healers and mentors and coaches spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Spent ex in fact, he was $50,000 in debt and couldn't go to his own mother's funeral because he spent all this money on healers and psychics and trainers and coaches. And so, and he was a life coach himself. This guy, I don't know what I really saw, but I started unraveling energy and it was from his mother. And, and it may have been with her death or the experience growing up. I can't recall. And here's the other problem with this Maverick is I don't remember all my sessions. I'm sort of accessing another part of my brain so I record the session, but it's for the client, not for me. So okay. unless I talk to the client about it, <laughs> I don't remember. So that's why when you said to me, oh, okay, where do I start? Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, bless his heart. Um, almost immediately, 
he started having increased income. His, his client base was growing. He had business changes. He had physiological changes. His whole level of confidence shifted. Um, his whole dream was to be a Bollywood star. He was a real handsome Indian fella, tall and, you know, bodybuilder type. And after, shortly after working with me, he became a stand-up comedian. And huh. there he was fulfilling his dream. You know, he was becoming a leading uh, stand-up in the whole Eastern region. And no, like India and Dubai, Middle East. Yeah, it was quite phenomenal. So that's just a snapshot. Um, but he made the best money in his life. And it was interesting one time he said, Amira, you know, I know when I go on stage, I'm channeling. I don't know where this energy comes or what the information is, but I start, I feel different. It's like something clicks and there I'm in my zone. Mm -hmm. And so we created a system just for him. It was a special meditation that he did before he went on stage. And every single time he got like resounding results and it was consistent. And so that was kind of a special and unique um, thing. But, you know, he, he did a testimonial for me, a video. He said, you know, Amira, there's a lot of people I've gone to and there's a lot of people out there. But, you know, to I just I'm just in a way he's in spirit now. He's made his transition, but he comes to me all the time and he kept saying, Amira, you're the real deal. He goes, mm -hmm. when I came to you, I didn't believe you. I thought you were some, you know, another mm -hmm. freak, but I'll give it a whirl because I'm desperate. But I came to prove it to him that I wasn't, you know. That's cool. And yeah. yeah, that being being in tune with that, whatever that is that musicians or entertainers or creative people feel, I've 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 been in that kind of flowing stream as well. It's like it's hard to explain, but it, it is a thing. It's a zone, it. right? Yeah. You're in that zone. We all want to be there, whether whether you're a mother right? Or whether you're a teacher or I remember one writer years ago, she came to me and she, and she didn't say she had a writer's block, but she was struggling with her career. In fact, she was floundering doing other things. She wasn't writing and she was a journalist. And then all of a sudden I said, what happened to you when you were eight? I see your heart frozen and it's almost like your creativity was frozen. And she goes, oh my God, I was hit by a car in the front of my house as a kid in the winter and I was laying on the ice and my mother was on the inside of the house. She didn't come out. She waited until the ambulance took me away watching out of the window. Oh, geez. So literally there was an aspect to her, not completely, but there was an aspect to her that was literally frozen. Jeez. And when we triggered that, opened that up or cleared that, everything started flowing in her life again. And it was huge. I mean, it would be something like, okay, you were fine, but it was traumatic for an eight-year-old for her mommy not to come out. Yeah. Well, I think we're, as, as humans, we are definitely doing something wrong because we, we experience trauma and negative things and, and we're definitely not processing it properly. I don't know if it's our society or, or culture, but it, it seems like most of us, and if not all of us, probably have little blocks or little things that we're suppressing and and need to kind of come to terms with to be able to really thrive and and, and as well as unlock these these latent gifts that we might have. You know that was well said, Maverick. I it's more than just the emotions, though. Okay, if you take the emotion and realize at a quantum level, it's just energy, and so. Yes, we're, what we're doing wrong, it, we didn't have permission to feel, to openly be transparent. Oh, in our society here in the West, we're afraid of anger. You know, Italians and Egyptians, they can shout it out and they have a big blow up and they're hugging and kissing in 10 minutes later, <laughs> right? On yeah, their way. They maybe, forgot that's, about it. maybe that's healthier just to get it out instead of exactly. constantly just pushing it exactly. down and, and letting it kind of like shaking a soda up but not releasing the pressure and fester and build up and to grow into something that we call cancer or something <laughs> yeah. else right and so yeah that's where we're taking responsibility starting to understand it's just energy instead of attaching a meaning to it all the time i think we get hung up on that too because then we're in this world of duality of right and wrong 
right? And then it's got to be this way or it's got to be that way. Well, who says? And, you know, when we can be neutral to it, that releases the resistance to it. And the judgment, and that's the secret to shifting it. So it can sense. still be there. That memory can still be there. That experience will never go away. But the charge on it, that energetic charge will be dissipated and no longer affecting you. That makes sense. If I'm kind of imagining like scales, you know, when it's too heavy on one side, it tips. And if you have too much negative energy, it's going to offset the balance and, and it needs to be kind of brought back into balance for everything to work. Exactly. And so the more we, we kind of get with this notion and realize, wow, as an energetic being, what am I limiting myself to as an experience, you know, multidimensional being of light? That's what we are. Mm -hmm. And so when we can start to embrace that and let go of some preconceived ideas or notions of limits, oh my God, the sky's the limit. So it, it seems like this is a, a great opportunity for you to tell the listeners kind of what you do and, and where they can connect with you and 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 talk with you more about the, the, the services that you offer, because it's, it's a lot of this healing. Yes, I am a healer. I'm a multidimensional energetic healer. Um, you know, call me spirit medium, call me clairvoyant, call me a medical medium, call me whatever you want. You know, when you can see the energy, you can move it. And that releases and takes us to the next step. So yeah, my website is amirahall.com, A-M-I-R-A-H-H-A-L-L.com. And I really encourage people to go there and download my stress buster. It's a guided meditation. It's an introduction to the, the beginnings of moving energy. It's like an energy shower to start releasing what's not you. And so it's a real powerful step in what part of my tools, what I call the quantum energy tools. And also I have um, other programs of chakra healing and um, life mastery trainings on my site. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I do. We each, each individual person is so unique. So it's a journey to explore together. Awesome. And I'll include information in the description of this episode for people to follow that. Um, Amir, it's been amazing talking to you uh, in the tradition of this podcast. I always like to ask my guests at the end, what is your best evidence of the afterlife? So I'm wondering if there is uh, something or, or any number of things you'd like to share that for you have really proven to you, like there's definitely more than this. There's got to be an afterlife. Well, having had a near death experience, I, without a question in my mind, no, there's an afterlife, but having connections with loved ones from the other side. I remember one time I was just absolutely zoning out on my sofa and just staring off into space. And that moment I heard, hi, honey, how are you? And it was my grandmother that came through the doorway. She had been on the other side for years and she would always call me and ask me for lunch or, you know, that was her tone. And it was like so random. I was just like, oh, grandma, you're here, you know. And honest to gosh, that happens to me on an almost regular basis with some loved one from the other side. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's just the other night when I was chatting with that lady with that fibromyalgia, I said to her, I said, were you... Um, there was somebody in her life that was seamstress or sewing and they were um, always trying to protect her in a way that nobody quite understood her. And she goes, yeah, it's, I'm the namesake of my grandmother. I said, well, she's standing right behind you. So, you know, there was more information that came out about the grandmother wanting her to resolve her emotional um, hangups. So that all came out. So every single day, <laughs> Maverick, I get an experience. And so it's almost not, it's normal for me, not paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Amira, thank you so very much for being on the podcast today. It's been amazing speaking with you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. To find out more and connect with Amira, check out the links in the description box below. Thanks for tuning in today.